the nip slip is perhaps the single most clickbaity thing on the internet today. It seems celebrities are always letting one fly, perhaps by accident or perhaps not, and it kind of feels like it's become the new normal now. But if you think about it, a slip only exerts such appeal because of the Western taboo against female toplessness, which is very much alive today. Toplessness for women remains forbidden in many places in the Western world, despite a growing movement for equity in that regard. Now, there are, of course, many cultures across the world where traditionally it was no big deal at all, or perhaps even the norm. But did you know that even in our Western culture, it was only very recently indeed that it became the taboo that it is today? In fact, for a period in Renaissance France, it was the height of fashion to let one or both fly free as a bird. And after that, in the Enlightenment period, things continued to be quite a bit more liberal than today with dresses intentionally designed for wardrobe malfunctions. And I'm not talking about just Paris models here either. It turns out that the history of female toplessness in the West is far more interesting than you ever might have guessed, or perhaps exactly as interesting as you might have guessed. Either way, that's what we're talking about in today's showcase episode. I'm B.T. Newberg, and this is the history of sex. History of Sex is sponsored by Dr. Jillian Kenny, historian of women, sex, and magic in medieval Europe. Hey folks, yes, I know that this month I promised that we'd have an episode on the Wild West from the Native American perspective, and that is coming. Actually, it's going to be a multi-part series in its own right called Sex on the Great Plains, focusing on the Lakota. The script is written, but it's way too long, and it needs to be edited down, and this is just not one to rush out the door for the sake of a self-imposed deadline. So that is coming. That'll be coming next month. In the meantime, let's talk toplessness. So this is a fun little episode from my other show, Dead Ideas, but it fits perfectly on the topic of sex and gender, and so I always intended to fold it into the History of Sex show here. And, well, I guess today is the day. So, what was it like to let your birds fly in relatively recent Western history? That's what we're talking about today. Enjoy. So, this is something that I discovered randomly one day on the internet, and I just, I couldn't... I couldn't put it down because it's just so interesting and so contrary to the way we think about uh, women's bodies today. And this topic is going to be sexy. It's going to be salacious. It's going to be a little bit giggly. It's going to be a little bit tee-hee. But it's also like a legit part of Western European history. And it's just endlessly fascinating to be. So, all right, let's do it. The Renaissance fashion of showing one boob. Or one or more boobs, actually. It kind of got out of hand really quickly. (laughs) So, you may have seen religious paintings of the Virgin Mary suckling baby Jesus, or even suckling saints, or even sometimes this particular genre of painting. You see the Virgin Mary with one boob out, and she's like pinching her teeth so that milk comes out in a stream, and it's falling down into the mouth of the saint, this kind of holy nourishment kind of thing. And you look at it and you're like, oh, there's nothing sexual. There's nothing, anything like that about this. This is just purely holy and platonic. And just, this is about mothering, not sex. Well, actually, yeah, maybe. But the background to this genre has a little bit more to it. (laughs) Okay, for example, one painting from the 1400s And by the way, all of the paintings and images that we're going to be talking about today, there's going to be quite a few of them, we will post them on the episode post at www.deadideas.net. So if you want to follow along, 
feel free. That's where you can find all these images. Okay, so one painting from the 1400s called Virgin and Child Surrounded by Angels by Jean Foucault depicts the Madonna in a French-looking crown, a blue bodice that is open to expose one breast, and she's, it's like, you know, she's about to suckle the baby Jesus. However, if you were, if you were there at the time when this painting would have debuted in France, you might possibly have been clued in to a little extra layer of meaning to this painting, because this wasn't really just about the virgin and child. That's just the veneer, but really what it was was about the woman who posed for this painting, who was none other than a woman named Agnes Sorrel, who was mistress to King Charles VII of France. Yeah, Agnes Sorrel. I don't know if you've heard of her before. She lived from 1422 to 1450, and this was the same age as Joan of Arc, by the way, just to give a little context. And in fact, Charles VII was persuaded by Joan of Arc to be crowned King of France, so the story goes. And this Agnes Sorrel was mistress to this king. So when you looked at this painting at the time, if you were clued into this fact, you would see, oh, Madonna and child, oh, motherly bared breast, but you would also think, oh, the king's mistress. What else does that boob mean? Now, before we go any further with this narrative, let's rewind just a little bit to kind of set the historical background to this. Let's talk about what was it like to think about women's bodies and women's fashions in the age just leading up to this, in the medieval age. So previous to this, in the medieval era, women's fashions were extremely swaddled. If you've ever seen any of those old paintings from the medieval period, a uh, very different kind of style than they had in the Renaissance, much more, um, you th almost, almost like they were drawing comic books, kind of. But I don't mean to belittle them, that's just how their style was. Uh, but if you've ever seen women in that, they are covered from neck to toe. They're covered you know, hair is covered, neck is covered, even chin is covered. And it's really kind of not unlike what we think of today as a fairly extreme Islamic kind of view of women's fashion and what should or should not be covered up. But in contrast to how we might think about Muslim fashions today, this whole idea was by is by no means unique to Islam at all. In fact, before the Muslim hijab, there was the Christian headscarf, and before it was Christian, it was Greek. Back in ancient Greece, women used to cover their hair with a scarf. And before that, it went back even further, as we learned in our cuneiform series, all the way back in ancient Sumer, the oldest city-building culture that we know of, women were wearing scarves to cover their hair. So this has a very, very long history. And in medieval Europe, Women were extremely swaddled. They covered everything. Yet, all of the body locations of women being covered, pretty much, except for, like, face and hands, not all of them were thought of as equally scandalous. Much as today, there were lines in the sand for what counted as NSFW, <laughs> right? Not safe for work, right? And at the time, in medieval Europe, the line in the sand was quite different. The line in the sand back then was legs and ankles and shoulders. You did not, by any means, want to be caught exposing those in public. That would have been scandalous. Nipples, on the other hand, were mm, more like exposing shoulders or cleavage today. It's like... Uh, there's something kind of sexy about it, but y y you don't really look that askance at it. It's just like, oh, okay, she's a little more on that side, but well within the norm for society. It was somewhat sexualized, yes, but by no means shocking. So, so it it really was like if you so in medieval Europe, if you saw a nipple, it was like, well, okay, yeah, I got my nipple in for today, but you're, otherwise you go about your business. <laughs> it wasn't like, oh my god, legs. 
<laughs> that's where you really would have had a day. Or if you're the one whose legs are being exposed, you just would have been mortified. Okay? Now, as we move from medieval Europe into the Renaissance, views of women's bodies start to change a little bit. Some of it, I'm sure, must have been influenced by bringing back the old classical models in uh, sculpture and uh, paintings, because, of course, in the Renaissance, uh, Western Europe rediscovered uh, the ancient world, right? And got philosophy of Plato and Aristotle and Socrates, and you started getting painters who were influenced by the idealized bodies of the Greek nudes in sculpture, and depictions of the nude body started to become a thing again. So I can't help but think that that certainly must have influenced the way that people thought about bodies, and in particular women's bodies, in Renaissance Europe. Now, finally, back to Agnes Sorel. So Agnes Sorel was the daughter of soldier Jean Sorel and noblewoman Catherine de Magnolet. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. She was introduced to Charles, the future king, when she was 20 years old. So not too young, actually. I mean, by the standards of the day, that was that was like five years into your marriageable age. So, you know, not too young, not too old. And here's the thing about Charles is he was prone to depression. And when she is introduced to Charles, it brings him out of a long depression. And as a result, people are like, um, hmm, okay, this guy's already married, but this girl is clearly a good influence and we want our king to be active. And, you know, so they're like, well, maybe she can be his mistress. And it becomes okay. <laughs> Agnes Sorrel becomes the first officially recognized royal mistress in France, and I believe in pretty much all of Western Europe at the time, uh, definitely in France, the first officially recognized royal mistress. As a result of being the royal mistress, she gains considerable influence over the king. Everybody at the time is going to want to be vying for FaceTime with the king to, to have influence, right? And here she is. He's got a natural reason to want to be around her, right? <laughs> he loves her bod. <laughs> Sex, right? So she's got FaceTime with the king all the time. She gains considerable influence. And this earns her the scorn of many of her enemies. That'll come back. Other things about Agnes Sorrel, and this brings us to our main point today, she is credited with rather extravagant tastes in terms of fashion, among which is a predilection for wearing low-cut gowns exposing one breast. Now, any other woman in the kingdom, perhaps if they had this kind of eccentric idea about fashion, may have people might not have batted too huge of an eye about it, but she just kind of would have been that weird eccentric lady, right? But of course, this is a lady with extreme influence, and everybody wants to model those who are at the top of the social pyramid, right? And so she becomes a trendsetter, right? Her fashion of exposing one breast becomes all the rage in court, and court ladies begin to imitate her, exposing one breast or even both breasts. And I don't know if the both breasts is meant to be like taking it one step further, like a one-upsmanship kind of thing, or if it's just like uh, one boob today, two boobs tomorrow. <laughs> I'm not sure about that part. But it catches on like wildfire. Now, notice we're talking about noble women here. We're not, gonna we're not talking about commoners, and we're definitely not talking about prostitutes. We're talking about noble, proper ladies, and they're letting it all hang out because all of a sudden... That is the fashion. <laughs> so think about it in a different way than you would think about it today. This is not like Paris Hilton or let's say like Bai Ling, who manu Bai Ling is famous for manufacturing her nipple slips, and it's all about the sex of it, right? And it gets her uh, attention from the media because she knows that her nipples are going to be on the front page of whatever the next day, right? It's not quite like that. Yes, it is sexualized, as we said, but it's much more about a fashion statement and less about a sex statement, okay? So this becomes the fashion. But, it, like, but you know, 
But it's not pornographic, is my point. It's not porn, it's fashion, okay? There's a sexual element because it is associated with the mistress role rather than the motherly role. And when you would have looked at that painting of the Madonna Lactans, if you were clued in, you would have seen the irony between those two roles, and there would have been something a little bit tee-hee about that. But the point is that it was not pornography. It was not pornographic. This was fashion. Okay? So, this catches on in France, and it starts to go beyond France. We get some reactions starting to show up in the literature. For example, across the pond in England, King Henry VI, who also lived in the 15th century, so the 1400s, I always have to kind of like do it in my head. 15th century means 1400s, 16th century means 1500s, etc. Anyway, in 15th century, so 1400s, King Henry VI of England complains of the court fashion of bearing the breast as disrespectful, right? So, mm, maybe something not quite surprising. We do stereotypically tend to think of English tastes as being ever more conservative than French tastes. But it. But what's most interesting to me here is that clearly it had made its way to England by this time. This fashion was showing up in England. And if, in fact, at the time England was more conservative, it's like, oh, it made it even to England, right? Okay, so, so Agnes Sorrel, this trendsetter, unfortunately dies young. At first, she is thought to have died of dysentery, which had to be common enough back then. Pretty believable. But in fact, modern examination of her remains has revealed mercury poisoning. Remember I said it was going to come back, that people were envious of her influence, and so she had many rivals that scorned her. And the question is, is it possible that her rivals could have poisoned her to get back at her? It's possible. Another possibility, though, is that it could have been the result of cosmetic products of the day, which included mercury. Or even it could have been medicines used to treat worms, which also included mercury. There was a thousand and one ways to die in the Renaissance, and uh, mercury was used for a lot of really strange things back then. So she kicks the bucket. After Agnes Sorrel, the fashion... Mm, probably dies down for a little while, but it keeps popping back up from time to time. We, we find this kind of showing up again and again in the historical record as we go through time. So let's review that now, okay? So, in the late 15th century, circa 1480, there is a, uh, no, there is a noble woman, Simonetta Vespucci, I believe she's Italian, who is immortalized in paint, as you do, you know. There were no photographs back then, so you always had your portrait done if you could afford it. Uh, this was the Renaissance version of Instagram, right? And how does she want to be remembered by her descendants, by everyone who sees this portrait for time immemorial? Well, she wants to be remembered showing her bosom. <laughs> and so she has herself painted that way. Aristocratic women of this age were quite proud of their bosoms and had themselves painted, often just show and let it all hang out. Because, like I said, that was the fashion. Okay, so moving on, going into now the next century after that, the 16th century, so the 1500s. Women's fashions of displaying the breast become common not just among noble women, but common across society. It becomes emulated by all classes of society. This is not too surprising because it's a pretty common trend that those at the bottom of the pyramid kind of want to emulate those at the top. By that kind of imitation, you sort of like implicitly kind of make the statement that you're rising up, right? So common women start to adopt this fashion. Even common prostitutes all the way up to queens can be seen sporting this fashion. And in the 17th century, so the next one after this then, we even get a depiction of Queen Mary II of England in a woodcut with both breasts exposed. And it's a, <laughs> it is a bizarre woodcut, I'll give you that. Look it up on our website, trust me. It's really strange how these woodcuts kind of look. I mean, it's not sexy at all. It's just, it's almost more like one of those comic book porns that you have today that are like, 
clearly not supposed to be sexy. It's just more about the tee heat of it. If you look at this one, it's like <laughs> her, her proportions are all weird. Her boobs are kind of where her armpits should be. <laughs> it's really weird. You should definitely check it out. But anyway, the caption clearly labels this as the queen of England sporting this fashion. So there you go, right there, right? And, and it goes further yet. Henrietta Maria, wife of Charles I of England, has a mask costume, so like a costume for a masquerade, right? Designed by a certain Indigo Jones, and her costume is said to have revealed both breasts. So again, there's another instance of even a queen, you know, the properest of the proper, with all eyes on her, you know, sporting this fashion. Paintings that I've seen of it, which have been done like long after, so I don't know if it's accurate, tend to show her costume as like having kind of a diaphanous cloth over it, so not just nakedly exposed, but regardless, it's diaphanous. You could see right through it, right? So it's kind of like a spin-off of the fashion, I guess you could say. Further evidence from the 17th century, we have, uh, we've dug up like ladies' dressing tables and stuff. We've got that kind of evidence and uh, archaeological remains of what they had, like at the ladies' toilet where they were doing their makeup and whatnot. And quite commonly, you would find a certain kind of orange-red carnelian. And what was this used for? Was it used for lips? Was it used for maybe eyeshadow? Nope, it was used for making up your nipples. It was used to give that nice little flare of color to make your nipples really pop. That's what that was for. So, clearly, this was a very important kind of thing to pay attention to and that you want to flaunt when you're getting ready to go out at night right? In the 17th century, we also get a comment from a certain playwright named Thomas Randolph, and here we start to get some interesting male reactions. And uh, this playwright, Thomas Randolph, writes, Would nakedness were come again in fashion? I had some hope then, when the breasts went bare, their bodies too would have come to it in time. <laughs> so there's a male kind of nudge-nudge little line from a play. It's implied here that the fashion had gone, but had been around in the recent past, and he was hoping for it to come again because there is this, some kind of hint of what comes next after you get to see those two little carnelian dots pop out of the dress, you know. In contrast, there's a different kind of male reaction that also comes to us from the 17th century. This is from a 1678 polemic against toplessness entitled A Just and Seasonable Reprehension of Naked Breasts and Shoulders Written by a Grave and Learned Papist. Papist meaning Catholic, right? Papist like Pope. This was translated by Edward Cook Esquire with a preface by Mr. Richard Baxter. And here is the quote from this polemic against this fashion. In a word, if they neglect beauty and the health of their souls, yet let them at least take care of conserving the health and beauty of their bodies, of which they are idolizers. Are not they to be blamed for putting themselves upon the rack and torture only because they would appear to be dressed up in the mode, that is, in the fashion of the day, right? and to give some charm and grace to their breasts, because they would have them seen. To how many infirmities and distempers do they not expose themselves in their overlacing their gown bodies, and so thrusting up their breasts on purpose that they might show them half naked? How could so ever the weather be, and sharp the air, yet they endure it without complaining, provided it does not alter or prejudice the beauty of their necks, or bring upon them fluxes and rooms, and rooms is spelled like rheumatism there, so I imagine that's what that means, which are the ordinary effects of their going naked. They support with a resolute courage and constancy the rigor and severity of all seasons to have the pleasure of being seen, and the hopes of being able to please. <laughs> so there's a polemic against it, a different kind of male reaction, right? Kind of like the conservative reaction to it. Uh, so this is clearly taking the health aspects, being like, you're going to catch cold, <laughs> I guess, is the idea here. Um, <laughs> which it seems like maybe a little bit of an exaggeration. I mean, 
it's not that uncommon to have other parts of your body exposed. So why focus so much on these particular little dainty little things on your chest? Uh, and you have to expect that, you know, this is kind of a thrown up as a veneer argument for a much more conservative desire to control the female body, perhaps, uh, which is the subtext here. But nevertheless, I think it's it's kind of interesting. Especially, I like the way that he talks about the women, like, enduring the cold in order to <laughs> in order to sport this fashion because that just completely reminds me of say like a girl today who it's in the middle of the winter she's going clubbing she's not going to bring a coat even though it's icy and snowy outside she's just going to like shiver through it and wait in that line because she doesn't want to have to hold her coat when she gets inside the club <laughs> it totally fits in it's the exact same psychology right <laughs> so <laughs> women were doing it even back in the 17th century so this, uh, all of these things that I discovered uh, by, you know, just searching around once I discovered this on the internet randomly one day, just really fascinated me that like, wow, this is, this was a fashion. This was a thing. I had never heard about this before. You never hear about this. This was, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just a little bit perverted, but um, I, I couldn't help but having to re research right into this. And apparently I'm not the only one because... A historian named Angela McShane Jones from the University of Warwick has actually studied this fashion, and she's published her findings in an article entitled Revealing Mary. Specifically, Angela McShane Jones studied those woodcuts that I was talking about, and uh, the woodcuts were used typically to illustrate something called broadside ballads, and this was one of the most popularly consumed forms of literature back in the day. And a broadside is a kind of folded up piece of paper, somewhat like a newspaper today. So I imagine it as being kind of like really kind of a cheap grade of paper. You uh, kind of print it in huge sheets, not a lot of cutting labor involved. So it's probably, you know, that brings down the cost of production. And so it's able to be consumed by a wide audience that doesn't have a lot of money to pay for, you know, reading material. And you would illustrate your broadside ballads, your reading material, with these woodcuts. And typically on them would be printed the lyrics of ballads, and then these ballads would be illustrated with woodcuts. And an example of this would be the Roxburgh Ballads, that has many woodcuts showing exactly the fashion that we're talking about today. Another is Samuel Pepys's Diary, that shows a lot of them as well. And these woodcuts show women with fully bared breasts, like I said, not exactly very realistic or even attractive for that matter, but clearly and with, you know, unable to be argued that, yep, those are two breasts just hanging right out in the open. And uh, you have to imagine that the purpose of this was, well, I mean, it was clearly a selling point. It was a selling point for male buyers. It was probably also a selling point for women buyers because, you know, who's the consumer today of magazines with uh, the scantiest clad women on them. You think of, you know, women's fashion magazines, it's very scanty. Uh, women are always interested in what turns men on, right? Or we don't have to be gender binary about it even. Okay, so anybody who's interested in men's opinions will be interested in what turns men on, right? So any way you want to think about that, it makes sense. So it's just a good selling point, just as it is today, sex sells. And so illustrating woodcuts with these sorts of images totally worked at the time, right? The thing about woodcuts, though, is producing a woodcut is expensive. It's not like those cheap paper broadside ballads. You have to, you know, put a lot of labor into carving them out and, you know, etc. So the effect of that is once you've acquired one of these woodcuts, you're probably going to reuse it a lot. So if you've got one with this fashion, you're going to be using it on a lot of different broadside ballads. So think of it kind of like stamps today, you know, and stamp collecting and crafts. If you've got a need for a Victorian hat, uh, you're not going to carve out a new one each time. You're going to pull out the one you've got, and you're going to use that on every crafty thing that you need a Victorian hat on, right? Same thing here. So that puts into context that broadside ballad that we saw before, where it depicted Queen Mary sporting this fashion. So the question becomes, 
was it really trying to depict a fashion that the real historical Queen Mary wore? Or was the publisher of this broadside ballad just, did he just need an image of a fashionable woman to represent Queen Mary? And therefore he took this one that he had on hand with this fashion and used it for Queen Mary. Hmm. So there's a little qualification to that aspect of it. It's a little bit more complicated than we thought. But either way, it still kind of shows how popular the fashion was. Because A, if Queen Mary did wear this fashion, then clearly, you know, it's okay. It's socially acceptable even for the queen to be bearing both breasts. Or B, if she didn't and it was just used to represent her, it at least shows that it's not scandalous. It's not like underground, sort of treasonous kind of literature in order to depict the queen in this way. It's not like you're scandalizing the queen by using this image to represent her, because this nothing about the ballad that this shows suggests anything of that kind of literature. Either way, it showed that the way that people of the time thought about women's bodies was, suffice to say, very different than how we think about it today. So to summarize, Angela McShane Jones writes, In the 1600s, it was fairly commonplace for women to bear their breasts in public. The fashions were initiated by court members and queens, then replicated by ordinary women and common prostitutes. 17th century fashion, rather than demeaning women, could be empowering. The extremely low-cut dresses were designed to encourage men to look but not to touch they empowered some women to use their sexuality. So there you go. And I love the fact that she brings up the fact that this could be empowering, which is easy to forget. But you, when you think about it, in today's standards, very easy to understand too, right? Because you could just imagine, ladies and men, think about like when you want to feel your most confident, when you want to feel your best, you go in the bathroom before you go out at night and you put on your duds. You doll yourself up, and if making you feel sexy makes you feel confident, then more power to you, right? And even if you play like a psychological mind game with yourself, like I'm going to wear very conservative outfit on the outside, but on the inside, I'm putting on my sexiest underwear, <laughs> whether or not I think I'm going home with somebody tonight, it, it's a confidence boost, right? So you can be empowered by this kind of thing. I just like that she brought up that point because it's easy to forget. Okay, so anyway, so moving on. So where did this fashion go after the 17th century? Okay, so moving on into the 18th century, so the 1700s now, which are, of course, the, the years of the libertine, right? Interestingly, at this point, at least the way I see it, you start to see a little subtle shift in the view of women's bodies that starts to head in the direction of where, we, where things have gone today. So what you start to see in the 1700s are paintings of noble women in a spin-off kind of fashion, still clearly in the lineage of this fashion that we're talking about, but different. You see noble women in paintings wearing décolleté dresses, very low-cut dresses, that are cut just so, so that their nipples are not, they're not just out in the open, but they're just barely peeking out, like, oh, <laughs> like, oh, oops, here I am. <laughs> and this was the kind of dresses that were the rage of that time. So you can imagine that wearing a dress like this, that's just barely covering, when a woman is just like standing up straight, and has her arms at her side, probably the nipples are totally covered. However, as soon as she bends over to bow, or to doff her cap, or something, then all of a sudden there's just a little peekaboo, and there's an oh hello, <laughs> and then there it is. And to me, what that says is, now there's something about the nipple itself that is becoming the central focus of sexuality on this part of the woman's body. There's something about that specifically that is becoming, that's the thing that makes all the difference between just a woman's breast and, oh my god, a nipple. 
<laughs> because you're clearly using it in that way, right? It's like when the nipple pops out, that is the gawking moment, right? That's the moment when everybody's eyes are going to be on you. Clearly, it's starting to get to the point where you're doing it in that kind of biling kind of way where in a certain sense, you're trying to get on page one of whatever publication that the paparazzi are putting out, you know? So attitudes are starting to change just a little bit, right? Then in the next century after that, the 19th century, so the 1800s, attitudes change further. And now I, I couldn't really find very good information on France specifically, but the 19th century over in England for sure was of course the Victorian time. And we all know how the Victorians were obsessed with sex and chastity, right? So <laughs> the Victorian attitudes towards women's bodies change and it becomes big time taboo to reveal very much of your bodies. And in fact, the pendulum swings so far the other way that even male toplessness becomes taboo. Yes, believe it or not, yes. And male toplessness, this was something else that was just really fascinating for me to find. Believe it or not, male toplessness was a big thing for quite a long time. That was quite scandalous for a man to go around without a top on for quite a while. In fact, according to one site that I found, and I Make up your mind on your own on how much you want to trust a site like this. But um, it's an activist site, and the site is called gotopless.org. It cites a little factoid that says male toplessness was only legalized in America in 1936. 1936, that late. And the first topless scene in film was just two years prior to that, 1934, starring Clark Gable's chest in It Happened One Night. Hmm. <laughs> so that is interesting. So pendulum swings that far the other way. Now, again, I don't know quite how much stock I put in that little factoid that I just cited there, because I did also find that the same year that that Clark Gable movie came out, Tarzan also came out, also in 1934. And of course, Tarzan is a movie where the man was topless through pretty much the entire thing. So, hmm, how does that contextualize that? I, uh, it, it, it's a little bit foggy for me. I couldn't quite dig up much more than that about this, unfortunately. What I did find, though, specifically that contextualizes the Tarzan movie a little further and is interesting in its own right, that movie was a scandal. Tarzan was a scandal, but not due to the male toplessness. It was, it was in fact, only due to some female topless scenes that had to be deleted and didn't make it to the silver screen. So there at least we're seeing an indication that even though male toplessness was a thing, female toplessness was also still quite a scandalous thing. And the question is, well, then which one is more scandalous? Is it the way we would expect or the other way? And in fact, it seems uh, the female toplessness thing was more scandalous than the male toplessness thing. So there you go. I thought that was kind of interesting too. Just just to just to add further nuance and detail to the narrative here. Also that same year in 1934 there is court ruling on the books from Coney Island, you know, the uh, amusement park where eight men ventured to Coney Island without their tops on. And these men were brought into court and they were served with $1 fines from a female magistrate on the grounds that Quote, there are many people who object to seeing so much of your body exposed, unquote. <laughs> so there's another little piece of evidence of how men's, how, how male toplessness was viewed at the time. So that pretty much brings us to the end of the historical narrative that I've got prepared here for you guys. Now, today, of course, things have developed in a direction that we're all familiar with, right? Male toplessness is just fine. Female toplessness is a thing, right? And it has developed in the direction that the line in the sand for NSFW, now you know exactly what it is, right? It is clearly and unequivocally the nipples, right? You can show the top of the breast, you can show the side of the breast, you can show the underside of the breast, you can show cleavage, you can show anything, and it's considered acceptable 
But if there's any hint of areola whatsoever, it's NSFW, not safe for work, right? That is the line in the sand. And this is really kind of weird in the context of what we've been talking about in this historical development, right? This is kind of strange. And it also looks kind of strange from other cultures today, looking in on American culture. So, for example, my friend Kristaps Andresens, who does the Eastern Border podcast. Shout out to Kristaps. Uh, he's from Latvia, and he told me he described America to me one day as, quote, that place where they censor nipples, <laughs> unquote. <laughs> so even today, obviously, you know, views across different cultures are different. It just further contextualizes what we're talking about here. Another interesting kind of cross-cultural view. In Japan, which has a long history of showing everything in their pop culture art, right? So just check out the Yukio E woodcut prints, right? And they show a whole lot more than just nipples. They show like very graphic sex and it's just kind of like, yep, this was this is what we're showing now. <laughs> but today in Japan, if you look at Japanese comic books, so manga, very commonly the woman will be depicted Breasts might be hanging right out, but they just don't draw in the nipples. And this is actually a result of American influence after World War II. Because, of course, after Japan lost the war, America moved in. You know, there was a lot of American influence in, in how they redrew their laws and how the direction that their culture took. And one of the things that, for whatever reason, the Japanese latched onto was this censorship of genitalia. And in the case, at least, of manga women's nipples. Again, very interesting. So the nipple just becomes this line in the sand. And why did that happen? I don't quite know, but you can clearly see it. By 1927, you can see it for sure if you watch Fritz Lang's Metropolis, because there's a scene in that movie where the android female does a salacious dance. She's like this kind of like it's the Dance of Babylon kind of idea, where she's wearing nothing above the waist except for pasties. And what is the function of a pasty but to cover up the nipple and only the nipple? You get to see everything else, but the nipple is covered. And so there is there is no clearer message than that the line in the sand is the nipple. Anything further, and it would be porn, right? But covering up the nipple with a pasty allows it to pass and make it to, you know, the big screen. So that is a very clear indication that by 1927, at least, this modern attitude uh, from American culture and more or less from Western culture generally has reached this point, right? Perhaps one of the reasons why it developed this way is out of legal necessity. This is kind of an interesting little tidbit to the story. Because if you think about the other potential locations of women's bodies that could have become the line in the sand, for example, think of legs, think of shoulders, etc. All of these can be exposed by degrees, right? So you think of, what if it was legs? Okay, so you're going to cover everything, but now there's a fashion that's just like, you show that the that, that skirt is hiked up just one inch higher, right? Is that going to be acceptable, okay, maybe we could put up with that, and then one inch higher, and then one inch higher after that, and there's no clear cutoff point for where something moves from just kind of risque fashion to something, you know, that can be fined for, you know, something legally convicting, right, as like public exposure. However, the nipple offers a very clear yes versus no kind of binary kind of judgment, right? If you can see Areola, it's exposure. If you can't, it's just risque fashion, right? So perhaps something about the way that laws have to be written and decisions have to be made played a part in the fact that the nipple became the one thing that you can't show of a woman's breast today. So there you go. That's our show today on showing boobs, <laughs> on showing one boob or multiple boobs. That's our show on the topless renaissance. Interestingly enough, today there's some indications in some parts of uh, Western culture that indicate that we might be heading toward a topless renaissance of our own. For example, there, there are some movements that come at it from a different angle. 
specifically a social justice angle, such as the Free the Nipple movement today, seeks equal rights under the law for toplessness for both genders. You can look it up online. There's some kind of really clever and interesting images that you can find online where you see like a man and a woman side by side. And it's like caption says like, he can show it. Why can't she? Um, also, there's images of men topless, but having like, uh, you know, like tape over the nipples to make the statement of like, women have to do this. Why shouldn't I? And, uh, and it's just kind of interesting, a different take on this whole topic, right? Another way that um, female toplessness is showing up today is in protests. For example, think of the Femen protesters. It's a F-E-M-E-N. Femen is a, a movement for um, feminist and gender issues, and they use toplessness as a political tool. Typically, the women will protest topless with a political message written across their chests, and the point is toplessness gets people to look at you, when you get people to look at you, they see the message, and there you go. You've just disseminated your message. Clever, and more power to them. Um, so it's a way to use the direction that fashions have gone in our time era, you know, in our era, for, you know, what they see definitely as, as a useful political action. All right, so let's draw this to a close. That's our wild card for you. That's our dead fashion for you today. So there you go, folks. That was an episode from my other show, Dead Ideas, which you can find anywhere that you get podcasts. Or you can go to the website at deadideas.net, where the episode debuted under the title The Topless Renaissance. If you like what we're doing here on this show, you can support us by subscribing, rating, and reviewing on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Or you can pledge on Patreon, where $5 a month gets you a portrait drawn in the time period and culture of your choosing. I will draw you in whatever fashion or costume you want. And you know, when this episode first debuted, I did issue a challenge that I will renew, which is if anyone wants to send in their cosplay of today's fashion... I will draw your portrait from that photo for free. I don't care whether you are a woman, a man, a non-binary, or whether you have tape over your nipples or not. I don't care whether you are young or old, just so long as you're of legal age, because laws, and I don't particularly want to go to prison. But as long as you're of legal age, send it in. Everyone is beautiful. And if anyone's brave enough to do so, heck yeah, I am glad to draw you in this quirky historical, and empowering fashion. All right, next month, as I said, we'll begin the long-awaited series Sex on the Great Plains, focusing on the Lakota. The Lakota are a plains tribe who became known in the 19th century for highly rigid gender norms and supposedly for exploitation of women, but actually, a closer look reveals it was a little more complicated than that. In many surprising ways, in fact, they were actually closer to today's gender norms, in some respects anyway. For example, women were empowered to work and become highly respected craftspeople. Also, the Lakota felt that the true criterion for male or female was not genitalia, but behavior, which presages similar mindsets today. And finally, they recognized a third gender called the Winkte that went beyond the male-female binary. So there's a lot to learn and appreciate about the traditional culture of the Lakota, which has been systematically undermined ever since. They have been stripped of their land, their culture, and often forced into adopting Western norms, including gender norms. But nevertheless, they have survived and are a proud people today. So next month, we are going to dive in to that story. I will see you then. I'm B.T. Newberg, and this is the history of sex. Podcast theme music mixed from tracks by Kevin McLeod. For additional credits, references, photos, and more, see our website at www.historyofsexpod.com.